Okay, Helium and performance. How to wring the most out of your deployment. Um, this is going to be a fairly demo light talk. Uh, if it gets dry, just there's all these little sweets on the table. You just throw them at me or something. Um, keep it interesting, you know. Uh, okay, so it's me again. You'll see I've moved from being the JSI PFS maintainer to being the Helium maintainer. So things move fast. JavaScript is slow, right? It's super slow. I mean, it can be if you use it badly. There are things it's really bad at, like CPU intensive tasks, awful, the worst. Don't do it if you can help it. Async, also terrible. Um, async is not free. Like, we have to remember this. Now, so this is a, this is a picture of the browser event loop. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in very much detail. There are loads of really good resources out there. But the really important thing to notice is when you're calling browser APIs and you see it says promises and there's a little line, a tiny little line. Oh, by the way, I'm going to add something to the microtask queue. So every time you invoke a promise, uh, um, an item gets added to the microtask queue. And this is incredibly expensive uh, when you're doing stuff in a very hot loop. Um, you really don't want to do it unless you absolutely have to. And I think we, like, they have, a, like, promises have a lovely API. It's like, oh, wait, a thing, that's great. But then actually, it can be really, really bad. So how bad, so a quick demo of how bad it is. Uh, where's my thing gone? There it is. OK, oh, this again. So what have we got? We've got it pipe. So we use this a lot in JS uh, everything. Uh, it basically is for making pipelines of operations. Um, it all just takes an async iterable and just turns it into a, a list. So these, these modules have recently been refactored quite a lot. So I say it takes an async iterable. It takes an async iterable or it takes an iterable. If it takes an async iterable, it returns a promise of the things. And if it takes an iterable, it returns the things. So now these things are actually promise aware, uh, which, is, which is pretty, pretty handy. So we've got, we got a, synchro a synchronous pipeline here. So all we're doing is we, we're having a, 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 a list of numbers, five numbers. We're just going to iterate over the source, like iterate over this list, increment them, and yield them. The output of the first function is passed into the next function, and so on and so on. And at the end, we just collect them all together. So we've got a list of five numbers, and we've got five transforms, right, five transform functions, and then a sync at the end where we just collect them all. That's the sync one. And then the async version is exactly the same, exactly the same. The only difference is, We've just stuck the async keyword on, which we do a lot. All right, oh, yeah, async, no problem, no problem. So you've got the async keyword on there. We await the constants of the list. No, the, the list input is still a synchronous list. It's just, just an array of numbers. Do the do all the way, and then just collect it at the end, and then await the result. Now, we don't have to wait, await the result here, because the whole thing is, is, uh, the whole thing is synchronous. Node. Perf one. So we run the benchmark, bang, and you can see the difference, right? So the number of operations per second is 132,000 operations per second in the synchronous pipeline, and then 81,000 operations in the async pipeline. So it's a whole, that's an order of magnitude slower. And all we did, all we did was put the async keyword on things and await. So async is not free, definitely not free. Storage. Storage matters. How am I doing for time, by the way, DJ? 12 minutes. Okay, right. I'm going to have to start speaking really quickly. Okay, okay. Well, it would be nice to get us back on track. Anyway, storage matters. Um, CPU is boring in JavaScript, but I.O. kills everything. Like, it doesn't, a lot of the time, it doesn't matter if, you're out, if your algorithm is the fastest or not, because one, every time you hit the network or the file system or whatever, it just blows it all out of the water. An enormous bottleneck. So you have to think really carefully about the block stores that you use in your application. Uh, this is something that actually bit uh, us a while ago. Um, one of one of the our users opened this bug that the S3 performance was really slow. Uh, and there's this tiny little tiny little thing in the Amazon documentation. It says uh, your application can achieve at least 3,500 operations, or you know, different forget head whatever 
per second per partition prefix. And a partition prefix is basically a forward slash in the, in the, in the bucket path. The, what it doesn't say there is that if you don't have any forward slashes in your bucket paths, then it's one partition, which means that your entire bucket can achieve at the maximum 3,500 operations per second, which is awful if you're, if you're scaling. Really bad. And then, like, also, if you create 10 prefixes, you can, receive, you can do uh, 55,000 reads per second, which obviously, if you see that it was 55, if it was 5,500 and suddenly it's 55,000 with 10 prefixes, what's 5,500 times 10? It's like, oh, okay, right, that's a fairly linear, fairly linear thing. God, I wish you told us about that and just bigger writing. You know, so um, now, like, the S3 block store has learned from this and applies a default stru sharding strategy of just taking the, the last two... Uh, the last two letters of the path, reversing them and sticking them on the front. Uh, you can shard, like obviously, there is a limit per prefix. So if this prefix isn't, isn't long enough for your application, you can override these settings when you create your block store. Um, you should measure, measure everything before uh, making decisions. Other data stores are available. So like, we, have these, we have these two modules, block store core and data store core, and they include implementations of a whole bunch of different types of block store and data store. And they're not always stores. They don't always keep the information. Things like mount data store, I think, is, like, is very interesting, perhaps like something that has massively unrealized potential for, for performance. All your, all your um, data and blocks, they're all, they're all accessed by, in particular the data store, they're all accessed by keys. And the keys have a um, very predictable structure. So that means that you, can, that you can say with absolute certainty that certain classes of data are stored with certain keys. So you could treat, for example, uh, peer store data as ephemeral because the network changes a lot. You join, you leave, like if your peer ID changes, suddenly you have different peers that are CAD close to you. Um, so maybe you don't actually care that much about the peer store data. So if you had a mount data store and you just use a, um, you used a memory data store for the peers prefix, then all of your peer data would just live in memory. And then when you, when you shut the node down and start it up again, you haven't persisted this, but you also haven't, aside from the, the, the async tax that I just uh, went through, you haven't hit the disk at any point or hit a network or a database or anything to actually store this information. So it could, like if you, if you see a lot of peer churn, this kind of thing could make your application massively faster. The same way with um, some blocks, if you want to ensure that some blocks are very fast to fetch and others you want to store cheaply, you could put them on S3 or you could put them on Glacier storage or, or whatever. Go nuts, like this is a toolkit, you can build, you can build this. Tid data store is another one. So the way this one works is it um, wraps a whole bunch of different data stores and if you write, it will write to all of them and if you read, it will read from whichever one is fastest. So maybe you would have, you know, like WebT storage, for example, races a bunch of gateways against each other to fetch a block. We could use something like this. And that's the abstraction for you. And then, like, you know, they would just pull it from whichever one is quick. Maybe you could create your own, like the hot content block store. Like, I know the CID is going to be massive. It's going to blow up. It's my new album. It's incredible. So I'm going to write a data store that stores that CID in memory. Like the blocks that make that CID up stores them in memory. So they're super fast to, to retrieve. And everything else can go to the, you know, the slow storage. It's up to you. Uh, content routing. So content routing is really slow in general. Like there's just no way around it because it involves network requests. If you're searching for content, you have to, you have to hit the network and hitting the network is slow, regardless of the language. Um, so one thing you can do is you can configure delegates. So these are uh, different uh, implementations of content routing. And it, like JSLIP P2P will try them all. So some of them are fast, they're streaming. IPNI, of which there are some talks about this week, you should totally go and check them out, is, is novel because it has a streaming API. So the ones that don't have a streaming API, they return a, a JSON object that has a list of providers for a given CID, but there's the whole list. And once you get to the end of the list, there are no more. And the list is wrapped in a, in a JSON object, which means that the slowest provider to arrive, you get it at the same time as the fastest provider to arrive. So generally, you want to go for the ones that have streaming APIs. 
So IP9, IP9 has a streaming API. Whether or not it's streaming on the back end, I don't know, but it has the, the capability for this. The non-streaming ones, reframe, and then the old school delegated content routing, uh, which just hits the Kube RPC API. Pinning and garbage collection. So we care about this. This is more like an internal, internal thing about how Helia works. Um, but in the olden times, in JSIPFS, we switched from using a DAG. So the uh, list of pins that you had on a given node used to be stored in a DAG, and you used to have to manipulate that DAG, uh, which involved hashing things and all that kind of stuff, which is CPU intensive. And if you remember from this very first slide, CPU is awful, don't do it. So what this one does instead is it stores all the pins in the data store. And the data store is very fast, particularly in JS. And so what this graph is showing is as the number of pins that you have the time it takes to add a pin like, goes up and up and up. That massive spike is caused by the DAG that we had going to another level. So we'd filled, we'd filled the, like, one level of the DAG, and then we started a new one, which is, and then suddenly the number of calculations that you have to do to recalculate the root CID and that kind of thing massively goes up, which is why, why you see that enormous jump there. And then the red line at the bottom, which you can barely even see, is the data store, the data store performance, which is like massively, massively better. And this is the time it takes to add a pin. So you've got the old JS implementation on the top. You've got uh, Go in the middle, so that was Kubo. And then the new one, new one, is the red line at the bottom, like massively faster. And this is the number of pins that you're storing and the time it takes to store the next pin. So this is 100,000 pins in the data store. And the, the, it's kind of flat, which is what you want out of a, out of a refactor like this. So it's much more scalable. And that was just the, uh, I'm gonna go back one. So that was just the, uh, that was putting pins into the data store, but it doesn't tackle garbage collection, which has historically always been super slow until, until now. So Helia runs uh, reference counting um, for its pins. So it's a very simple idea. Um, that's the PR that it landed in. Super simple idea. You, um, there's a benchmark suite as well, which is what I'm going to talk about next is all the demos. But yeah, it's a super simple idea. The, every time you pin a DAG, you walk the DAG to ensure that all the blocks are present. Every time you encounter a block, you keep a count of the number of times you've seen that block in all of the DAGs. You increment it. And then when you unpin, uh, when you unpin a DAG, you walk the DAG again and you decrement that every time you, um, every time you, uh, every time you encounter one. And then when it comes to running garbage collection, you just look at the counts, and you're like, does anything have a count? Okay, you're safe. If not, you're gone, um, which just makes it much quicker because then you're, you're basically you're deleting the, the blocks as fast as you can pull the, the pin counts out of the database, which is a lot faster than, than walking a massive DAG. Because what, what would previously happen is you would walk every DAG of every pin, and you would say, right, these blocks are safe, and then you would walk every block and say, is it in that, is it in that set of, of uh, blocks? If not, then delete it, which is enormously expensive. Uh, whereas if you're just pulling stuff out of the data store, it's much quicker. So here's what happens. So this is the number of blocks uh, that have been pinned along the bottom and the number of milliseconds it takes to do garbage collection. And so Kubo is the red and Helia is the blue. And you can see that Helia is much faster. And as it gets further and further away, it gets bigger and bigger. I mean, this is what you want, totally what you want. Um, got some other useful stats out of it. So this is how you, uh, like when you're, when you're unpinning things, with Helia it's super quick because you're just doing like some database stuff. You're not really uh, doing a lot else. Uh, Kuba does a lot more work. When you're adding, adding blocks to the block store, I mean, adding pins. I mean, this is the, this is the, the good one, right? Adding pins is just flat, much faster. Much, much faster. And also, this is what happens when you, instead of just like blindly copying, like the algorithms that Kuba has works for Kuba, right? And it works for Go. And it doesn't work for JS because JS is terrible at CPU, whereas this approach doesn't use CPU. And so, it's, consequently, it's much faster. So, you write algorithms that are sympathetic to the environment that you're deploying them in, not because of the algorithms. So, Last section, DAGs and bit swaps. So bit swap's slow, it's really slow. I mean, like Ian's talk in the, in the keynote, he alluded to, uh, you know, it's, if you have sensible data structures, it's not necessarily slow, which is completely true. So like, what is a DAG? I'm just gonna go over what a DAG is. 
Um, I was going to use I was going to use the Dag Explorer, but it's really sad at the moment. It doesn't work, which is a shame because it's really lovely. If someone would like to PR a fix to this, maybe with Helia. I mean, that would be cool. Um, anyway, so I, I, I robbed this from some IPLD documentation. So what is a DAG? It's a graph. It's a directed, acyclic graph, um, which has an in interesting property in the, the way we do them. At least you don't know what's... Uh, uh, if, you, if you have to load another, another layer of the DAG, you don't know what's there until you've loaded it, which takes a long time, um, which is slow, and that's what we don't want. So what that means, essentially, the interesting fact is like every time you go down a level, you're, in, you're incurring a performance penalty. So maybe don't do that. Um, so again, here's some benchmarks. These ones are quite interesting. Uh, there's a pull request. It's not, it's not fully formed yet, um, but please do check it out. Anyway, so what I did here was I changed, I was changing the, uh, this is our bench line, sorry. This is the Kubo defaults, which JSIPFS inherited. Um, and you can see the, the, the size of the DAG along the bottom and then the time it takes to transfer between two nodes. And they're all kind of like, yeah, it's interesting. The, um, so Helio is actually somewhere up, up here, which is, means there's some, some low-hanging fruit, I'm sure, in BitSwap. Um, and what I did here is I increased the block size. So instead of having 256 kibi bytes, it's now one mibi byte. Um, and you can see the numbers on the left. So, you know, the, the top here is, is 150,000 milliseconds. And then the top goes down to 100,000. So there's a significant speed up just by making the block size bigger. Now, the interesting, one of the interesting things about this is Filecoin uses one megabyte block sizes. And, you, and there's al already, I mean, look how fast Kubo got. <laughs> like, you know, so Kubo is here, the Kubo to Kubo, to transfer one gig in 256 kibibytes. And now it's all the way down here. Um, so, like these 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 things really matter, uh, and you should totally benchmark the kind of data structures that you're creating. Um, as a, as just some stats, so Helia with 256 kibibytes goes from 10 seconds to seven to transfer 100 megs. Um, Kubo goes from eight seconds to two seconds, which is you know massive. Um, so when people say that BitSwap is slow, maybe it's not. Maybe it's the data structure that's that's wrong. Um, these things can definitely be optimized. That's it. So the, the important thing is to think about stuff. Like, don't take anything for granted. We need to measure things and think about our data structures. And like, nothing, no, no nice abstraction is free. Definitely not in JavaScript. Um, we should definitely make things better and faster. Thank you. That one needed more emojis, I think. I meant to ask after the last talk, but is there a certain channel that you hang out in where people can find you on Slack or anything like that? Uh, you can just at me anywhere. So I've been trying to be more in the um, IPJS channel. Cool. Um, but yeah, you can just at me anywhere. Good, good.